Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is MPC Research Topic 19-373. It is development of alternative, alternative bridge superstructures and is being brought to you by the Transportation Learning Network. TLN is a program of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University and is a partnership with the four state DOTs of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming and the Mountain Plains Consortium, which includes eight universities in Colorado, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Again, our presentation today is development of alternative bridge superstructures. It is the MPC Research Project 19-373. And our speaker today is Dr. Mostafa Tazarv. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at South Dakota State University. Prior to joining SDSU in 2015, Dr. Tazarv was a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Nevada, Reno, where he received his PhD. His research interests include the behavior of concrete structures, advanced materials for civil infrastructure, accelerated bridge construction, and large-scale testing. Mustafa is currently working on different research projects as the PI and co-PI with a total funding exceeding $2.1 million. His past research led to the development of a new generation of bridges that can be built faster, last longer, perform better in severe events, and cost less in long term. The first shape memory alloy SMA bridge in the world, well, the first one, was constructed in Seattle in which design and construction guidelines were based on his study in advanced materials. The unique aspect of this bridge and its continuous functionality after severe events with minimal damage and repair needs. Furthermore, his large and full-scale testing of bridges and buildings resulted in new design alternatives for the state of South Dakota and its local governments to save millions of dollars in bridge replacement, maintenance, and performance. He also invented a new connection for concrete structures to expedite construction and to quickly repair these structures after severe events such as earthquakes or hurricanes. With that, Mustafa, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's 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 actually my pleasure to share the findings of our study on the alternative bridge, bridge systems that we developed here at like, STSU. Uh, first uh, and most, I would like to thank my, my, my colleague, Dr. Dr. Webby, uh, here at like, STSU, and our uh, uh, master's students, uh, Michael Mingo and Zach, uh, like a Carnahan, who both uh, basically graduated and are actually uh, are actually working uh, in in a Kansas and and actually Iowa. Uh, so let's uh, get started with the uh, with the sponsors. Uh, we are uh, we are really thankful uh, to South Dakota State uh, to actually so, uh, to actually South Dakota DOT and like MPC for funding this project. And we are also thankful to Gage Brothers, who uh, uh, basically donated the precast uh, bridge for testing and the Grunwald uh, Engineering Laminates uh, in T South Dakota for donating the uh, timber bridges. We are also thankful to Journey Construction and HRC in California, who uh, worked with us and donated material uh, to this project. Uh, so with that, I would like to give you an outline of the presentation. Uh, I'll just give you uh, a quick uh, background and uh, what uh, was available in the literature at the time of the study. And then uh, I'll talk about the selected bridge alternatives and uh, how we designed them and how we came up with the test specimens, the way that we tested them, and I'll share with you the result of those tests. Uh, and uh, I'll share with you some of our recommendations. The full version of that can be found in our reports. And I would conclude with, with the overall evaluation. So in terms of background, I would like to start uh, basically sharing with you what kind of uh, bridge is currently typical for local loads in South Dakota. And I would like to share with you some of the typical damages that were observed uh, for these kinds of bridges. So in South Dakota, double T is the most common type of uh, bridge. There are basically currently more than 700 double T's 
in service, in a state. 75% of those are 20 years old or older. So that's the time that uh, we may need to like, repair or replace them. Uh, and we have found that structural detailing, aging, environmental condition, is basically especially Fusantau and the icing agents, and different kinds of damage will affect uh, the performance of double T's. And hopefully I can give you some options and, and an additional technique that you might uh, be using to replace these bridges. So one kind of common uh, damage that has been often basically reported for double T bridges is the reflective cracking of the pavement, which is caused by the weak uh, girder to girder longitudinal joints. Here is one example that uh, the test was done here at the STSU by Dr. Webby. So what he did he constructed a bridge consisting of two double T girders, put them side by side, and followed the current detailing. That is essentially uh, a shear key, and every five feet there is a steel plate that will be welded on side. So he has done uh, fatigue and strength testing of this bridge, and but it was found that uh, this joint is not sufficient and when you push uh, one of the girders uh, the bridge completely unzip and, and each uh, joint or each basically girder acts as an individual member. While this is not good and we want both and all of the girders act at the same time. Here in this chart you can see the loads applied to the girder A and this is the deflection of both of the girders, girder A and B. You can see that the deflection of the two girders are not compatible, meaning that the joint is not sufficient. So that's one of the issues with this bridge. It doesn't meet the current actual requirement for the joint performance. And uh, we only have one supplier of double T girders in the state. And uh, we know that uh, if we provide uh, more options uh, to the local uh, government, they will use it and they would have more tools when they want to design a new bridge or they want to replace one of uh, those that has, has the issues. Uh, the objective of this project was to find uh, different, basically single span alternatives that uh, could last for 75 year design life and we, we decided that the span should not be more than 70 feet because this is common on a, on a local uh, roads. And uh, we wanted to uh, uh, check their performance and proof test their direct behavior for the objectives. And we also compared cost, constructability, and performance of those. And I'll be sharing all of those with you today. So let's get started with some of the options that we initially found from the literature. Uh, one option is the big panel option. So in this case, uh, the precast uh, girder is set in place and the precast full depth deck uh, is placed on side and we have to fill the joint to provide a positive continuity. Uh, between the two components. So that's one way, one option that is out there. The another option is uh, through using the void at the slab. So here what you can see is one of the slab and we have to put them side by side uh, to cover the entire width of the bridge. And uh, testing has been done and that was basically another option that was available in the literature. Another option is using the uh, buffalo slabs and uh, to connect them to steel or precast girders using UHPC and open pockets as you can see here in this picture. And uh, the other option can be through using advanced material. This slide, this, this uh, picture uh, that you can see was a bridge that was made with advanced composite materials. Uh, the another uh, common type of bridge uh, that is out there and probably people don't use it as often as they should 
is uh, timber bridges. And there are three or four different types of timber bridges that be suitable for a local load. One is uh, the girder bridge. So in this case, the girders the, are timber, uh, and then the decks are also timber. We put them side by side, and then uh, the entire bridge is uh, constructed with that technology. Other alternative uh, will be using uh, panels, and we put the timber panels side by side, and that would be another uh, basically option. We will call in this study those bridges as a slab timber bridges. Um, the stress laminated timber is more or less the uh, same as the slab bridge, but because they we want to the bridge perform in the same way, all of this all of those slabs work at the same time together. One way to do that is to post tension all of uh, the deck panels in the transverse direction to provide the uniformity and a good performance of the entire deck. And one is that I found in, in the literature, and it's probably commonly the, uh, in Europe, is to put uh, timber logs uh, basically side by side and fill the top with the concrete. So that was another option. I did not see that many test data for that. So we didn't propose this at that time to the uh, panel, but it became um, became like, available afterwards. So that's, these are typical eight or nine options that uh, we could find uh, and propose those to, to, to STDOT project panel. After discussing and talking about the issues and providers, uh, they, they approved to go, uh, go ahead with testing of a full depth stick panel, uh, basically supported on the inverted bulb T girders, and test two types of glue lamp bridges, both slab, uh, both, both slab and actually the girder options. So what we did afterwards, uh, we tested 150 feet long fully precast bridge. We tested uh, 150, uh, foot long blue lamp girder bridge. We tested another shorter span, 16 and a half long slab bridge, and then we evaluated the performance and we checked uh, their their uh, their 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 actual performance and I compared them. So let's get started with uh, or test. Uh, test specimens and talk about how we had constructed them. The first option was the fully precast bridge, just to save time, and uh, I'll just call them fully precast bridge, but the full names will, will be full depth uh, deck panels, basically supported on inverted bulb T girders. Uh, what we could design uh, such a bridge in two ways. So in the first option, we could use two precast thick panels that will be crowned at the middle, and then we are going to take care of the longitudinal joint. That would be one way of doing this for a local uh, road because the width of the bridge is not that much, 35 uh, feet. It is possible to have thick panels that are just one unit and uh, definitely uh, the, the grade of the road before and after the bridge has to be adjusted to make sure that the 2% is, is basically uh, possible and actually feasible. So what we did, we picked two of the interior girders for testing and uh, it became to 50 feet long, uh, uh, basically a spe specimen that could uh, uh, cover approximately one lane of uh, traffic. So here in this slide, uh, I'm showing the uh, test specimen, uh, uh, kind of uh, a sketch up of the test, test specimen. We used uh, two 50 feet pre-stress inverted t girders, five precast panels, you can see here. Uh, each of those panels were 10 feet long. Uh, one side of the bridge we used uh, had hidden pocket in those. So here I'm showing the hidden pocket detailing. 
For the other side of the bridge, we use open pockets. I'll talk about later a bit more like detail. But the open pocket means that you could see the shear start from the top. The hidden pocket means that the, the studs could not be seen, so there was a two inch, uh, one and a half or two inch uh, construction cover which was filled later on with the grout. And we also use a female to female uh, panel to panel joint which were reinforced both longitudinally and transversely to provide a positive and negative continuity of the bridge to, to connect the deck panels in longitudinal directions we used uh, dual bars, we dropped them from top of the bridge, and we filled the joints with the grout. For uh, the glue lamb uh, test specimens, uh, the prototype bridge was 50 feet long and 35, uh, 34.5 or 35 feet wide. Uh, girders, this will be the prototype and we use a scale version of that for testing and this can be the prototype of the slab timber bridge 30 feet long and 35 feet wide. So for the test specimen, the test bridge was basically full scale consisting of three interior girders and 13 deck panels that were uh, placed side by side along the longitudinal direction of the bridge. Uh, this would cover approximately one lane of traffic. Uh, the reason that we couldn't go with the wider bridge was the test setup uh, limitations that we had here at STSU. We designed the, uh, the bridge to be built with 26F southern yellow, uh, yellow pine. Uh, however, by mistake, a lower uh, grade of wood was used. And I'll talk about what was the effect of that and how we can make sure that this doesn't happen in a real life. The, uh, the glue lamp slab test bridge was also full scale. Uh, we initially went with 20 feet long, but because we figured out that the, the wood grade was not uh, the one that we, we specified. So for the testing, we went with 16 and a half uh, feet long bridge and we tested that bridge for, for, for like fatigue and, and, and also uh, ultimate testing. We used two deck panels, put them side by side, uh, becoming eight feet. Uh, so it was slightly less than one lane, but uh, that was uh, basically possible to do here in the lab. I would like also to share with you the construction, uh, the construction stage of the three bridges uh, that we built and tested here at STSU. Uh, uh, the the, the precast bridge was um, uh, built with Gage Brothers uh, in Aksu Falls. And uh, to uh, build the precast panels and provide those uh, pockets, the, the, the actually full depth pocket was made uh, with, uh, with hardboard insulation as, as, as you can see here. So after the casting, we had nice uh, edge for the pocket and the hidden pocket was uh, made with the PVC pipes and plywoods and basically after the casting from top of the deck, this is what you could see. So the whole uh, inside that pocket was filled later with the grout. The inverted T-beams were uh, prepared and cast in two days, one per each, and the girders were 20 inch deep, post engine with 20 uh, grade 270 strands, and uh, either inverted U-shape and double headed studs were used. And I would like to also mention that two post-engineering uh, tendons were provided at the end and harp at the end to make sure that uh, the bridge doesn't crack at the end. The girders and panels were delivered to us here at STSU. Uh, we use concrete blocks as abutments, as you can see here in this slide. 
and the first panel was uh, placed from one end of the bridge toward another end to connect precast panels. Uh, we use the hollow structural steel. You can see the detailing here, and I'm going to show you the picture of that uh, steel component uh, here. So it was embedded in the decks, uh, and 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 basically after placing all of uh, the panels side by side, we drop uh, the longitudinal transfer steel bars to the hollow core steel uh, members. Here on this slide, you can see uh, the five panels that were placed. Uh, and basically, after placing those, their grids were uh, the grades were also adjusted using the leveling bolts. We had four of those per panel to make sure that the grade can be provided. Uh, our goal was because this bridge is going to be used on a local road, we have to minimize uh, the, the on-site activities from the underneath of the bridge. So the formwork that we came up with was to use uh, struts uh, and uh, make sure that there is no gap or there is no uh, obvious uh, uh, basically opening underneath of the bridge. So uh, this is kind of the form work if you look at it from the side. So this uh, was to avoid putting shores from the underneath of the bridge. Uh, this this like, photo shows the test setup. Uh, for the precast uh, bridge, you can see the actuator, the hydraulic jack at the middle of the bridge. This, this uh, test setup was used for the fatigue testing. We also altered for the other types of testing just to make sure that the bridge is tested for the worst case like the scenarios. Uh, and, and as I said, we were limited to nine and a half feet wide bridge because of the test setup limitations we had here. Uh, the Glulam bridge was also built in uh, in South Dakota by by Grunwalds in T, uh, and uh, the the Glulam deck panels were built from M29 Southern Union Pine, 35 uh, 1.3 uh, inch thick laminations were uh, were actually glued together to form the deck panels. After epoxy hardening, the panel edges were uh, were actually groomed and uh, routed to form a tongue and groove connection. I'll talk about the issue with this. Now we'll provide later uh, a recommendation to make sure that this is not going to happen anymore. There was some some damages after 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 testing at this uh, joint level. Uh, To, to construct the, uh, the glue lamp girders, 22 laminations were glued together uh, and the girders were specified, as I said before, to be built with 20F uh, Southern Inner Pine, however, by, by mistake, uh, a lower uh, grade of wood 24F was used in the fabrication process. Here you can see the widths of the uh, the girder and the depths of the girder as well. So to construct the bridge, uh, the, the girders were placed first. Then the glue, uh, uh, then the glue lamp uh, cross braces were bolted. Uh, subsequently, epoxy was used to connect the deck panels to girders. Also, epoxy was used to connect the panel to panel. Uh, connections. So, so all, uh, almost for all of the joints, we use like, epoxy uh, for the uh, positive and negative continuity. Here you also can see uh, uh, the epoxy is uh, placed between the top of the girder and bottom of the deck panel. And then here is the epoxy for panel to panel joints to finish that uh, tongue and groove connection. So the girder was uh, delivered to us as one uh, giant piece. So if I want to uh, go a bit 
uh, out of topic, you may use this alternative as an accelerated bridge construction as well because you can fabricate one line of the bridge offside and basically ship it to the side and put them side by side as many lanes as you have. So, so that can uh, be a good option for accelerated bridge, 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 bridge construction as well. We use the same um, uh, concrete blocks as the abutments of the bridge. We use load cells, we use strain gauges uh, to, to actually monitor the behavior of the bridge at the different stages. This slide shows uh, how we tested the glue lamp girder bridge using two actuators for the fatigue life. And let's talk about the construction of the glue lamp slab bridge. Uh, the glue lamp slab bridge had two panels, as you can see here. I show, I put the dimensions for one of those, another one had, had the same uh, basically sizes. Uh, and just to make sure that all uh, the two panels work together uniformly, three stiffeners were placed underneath of the bridge. And to connect those stiffeners uh, to the deck panels, we use bolts. Uh, however, we tried that the bolts not to penetrate uh, to the old depths of the deck. This was to make sure that there is no hole from top of the bridge and it would hopefully increase the durability of the bridge. So this is how one slab bridge can be built. Very easy, very simple. And I have seen like videos that a full scale bridge was built in eight hours using this technique. Here in this slide, I would like to show you the, uh, the, the fatigue testing of uh, the timber bridge, you can see that uh, the bridge, because the stiffness of timber bridge is not usually that much, we, we were able to see large deflections at the fatigue level. Uh, we tested each of the three bridges at least with half a million cycles of ashto fatigue two loads. We also tested uh, for intermediate stiffness to make sure that we are capturing the overall behavior of the bridge. And after the fatigue testing of each specimen, we also pushed the bridge to failure uh, to evaluate their ultimate behavior. Uh, I would like to share with you also the uh, fatigue testing of uh, the fully precast bridge. You cannot see that much of deflection, but you can see the reflection of lights in those water dams. We also put water dams on the joints to capture if there is any leak uh, underneath of the bridge. So let's talk about uh, test results for these bridges. Uh, this graph that you can see here in this slide shows the number of the uh, fatigue load cycles that we applied from zero to uh, 600,000. And the vertical axis is uh, the, uh, the effective stiffness of the bridge. You can see that when we started the bridge, uh, when we started the testing for the fully precast bridge and when we ended, the stiffness, the overall stiffness of the bridge didn't change much. So we could uh, tell that all of the joints of the bridge are structurally viable for basically more than 100 years of like service life. And for each of these bridges, these, these are ages that I will refer to are based on 15, uh, uh, 15 uh, trucks per day. So ADT, AD, uh, TT was, was assumed to be 15. Uh, for a local loads in South Dakota. So that's how I can say how many years this bridge could last. And if we want to compare the, the overall stiffness of this fully precast bridge with double T1, which is the blue uh, line here, you can see that the conventional double T bridge, the joints deteriorate very fast, even uh, less than 100,000 cycles of the fatigue testing, while the proposed option uh, has uh, basically 
constant constant like stiffness and the stiffness didn't didn't actually deteriorate, deteriorate. So it was a better option than the conventional double T bridges that is currently used in practice in terms of uh, basic surface service performance. Here is the damage of the fully precast bridge during the fatigue uh, testing. We have seen uh, basically shrinkage uh, cracking around all of the cold joints. We also have seen uh, these kind of a cracks on the hunch region. And for one of those open pockets that we filled last, uh, we also saw water leak underneath of the bridge at 25,000 uh, load cycle, which was around 12 years, if I'm not wrong. And we've been monitoring this joint, and it was very interesting because as the load cycle number went up, uh, this joint basically closed, and we did not see any further deterioration of this joint. Or uh, conclusion was because we used latex modified concrete for the open joints and previous studies had, had mentioned that uh, latex modified concrete has a better durability. That's why we use them in like open joints. However, latex has very fast uh, basic setting time in 30 minutes. It's get too hot and it's uh, 4,000 PSI strong. Uh, so this one, this one, this this open pocket was the last one that we poured, so it was around 30 uh, minutes. So, or best guess was this was just a bad pour because it was the last one that was poured. So, uh, be, uh, beside these damages, these minor damages that can be uh, well treated using a technique that is out there or using a better grout, uh, should be taken care of. And because we have seen this leak on the open pockets, what our recommendation would be do not use open pocket. Simply go with the hidden pockets, and I'll show on a slide uh, that basically there was no damage on the hidden pocket. So our recommendation is just go with the hidden uh, pocket is more durable. Here in this slide, I'm, go I'm actually uh, basically showing the force deflection behavior under the ultimate uh, testing. The first cracking of the bridge was observed at the load which was higher than the actual limit state. So, uh, and, and actually we stopped the test at two times the actual strength limit. Uh, minimal damage was observed at twice the actual strength limit state. And our conclusion was this option is viable and uh, it could resist all of, and it basically it could meet all of the actual requirements with, with a good like, safety safety margin. So I, or, or I overall the conclusion regarding the uh, precast bridge was it was viable and can be used for veal. We, we have some, some like recommendation I'll be sharing with you at the end how you can take care of those uh, minor, minor, minor cracks that were observed during the test. So let's talk about the glue lamb girder bridge. Uh, this slide also shows the same kind of the fatigue test behavior. This is the overall stiffness of the bridge. Uh, with respect to the number of the, uh, the fatigue cycles that were applied. You can see that uh, at the start of the test and at the end of the fatigue test, the stiffness of the bridge didn't change. And uh, it would say that all of the joints are actually viable. Uh, however, uh, uh, let me actually correct myself, I want to say that the uh, bridge stiffness didn't change. So, so, so like overall performance of the bridge uh, is okay. However, the only significant damage was observed during the fatigue test was those uh, tongue and groove male, female joint uh, of the panel through panels. Uh, to avoid this damage, all recommendation is do not use this shape. Uh, and just use the flat and panel to pallet joints and use epoxy in between to make sure that there is no such damage uh, 
uh, during the life uh, of the bird. So here in this slide, uh, I'm showing the strain profile of the bridge. So it's essentially a strain uh, value versus where we had the strain gauges along the depths of the bridge. It is clear that the strains of the deck were not compatible with the girder strains. Therefore, the blue lamb uh, girder uh, deck sections is not composite and the glue lamp gear just should be designed as a non-composite section, fully non-composite actually section. So that was one of the uh, big conclusions out of these uh, fatigue testing for this bridge. And here in this slide, I would like to share with you how the bridge failed under the ultimate load. Take a look at this box here, this red box, and that's where uh, the gear there's failed. In the next slide, I show you the close like photographs of the failure of the girders. So uh, two of the girders, uh, the west girder and the middle failed, uh, the east girder did not fail at or basically under the strength testing. Here, here the force deflection response of the glue lamp girder bridge is shown. Uh, the bridge did not meet the actual strength limit state because the as-built girder uh, material was weaker than the specified material due to construction error that I had mentioned. And the bridge girders were designed assuming a partial composite action. So we calculated this red uh, line. We, we actually calculated the bridge strength using the correct assumptions as uh, I just discussed, and we were able to, uh, to estimate the capacity of the bridge with a safety margin. So what our recommendation is, if you want to use this bridge, make sure that there is no composite action, design the bridge for that, and make sure that uh, the constructor or the builder is using the strengths of the material that you specified. And uh, let's talk about the last bridge that we tested, the glue lamp slab bridge. Under the fatigue testing, we did not see any deterioration. So uh, the bridge is viable for 75 years of service life. And the only damage that was observed was the widening of the natural or the construction gaps. And that was it. For the field, uh, field application, both of the timber bridges will be flooded at the top at the deck level with epoxy. So you would not see any of these gaps uh, for an actual bridge. For the testing, we did not uh, use any epoxy at the deck level. So uh, there was no stiffness degradation, no damage, except widening of the natural, natural cracks. We also uh, strength tested uh, the slab bridge. Uh, we went three times the actual strength limit state. The bridge did not fail. We stopped it. So here you can see the, the equivalent fatigue tool limit state, uh, equivalent uh, basic service one limited state and like strengths one limited state, all uh, much lower than where we went. So overall conclusion would be this bridge has good, uh, good capacities uh, to take ultimate, uh, uh, ultimate loads. So uh, for the rest of the presentation, I would like to share with you some of our, some of our recommendations. All of these, these recommendations were run by the panel, and we hope that following these, these, these recommendations, all of those issues and damages that we have discussed will be prevented when you want to use these options for field application. So let's uh, talk about the, the precast bridge, the inverted t girders, and the deck panel should be designed using a current code, let's say actual RFD, or if your state has a local, uh, has its own uh, design manual, you should be able to design all of the precast members following uh, that code. We recommend that the uh, panel uh, width be actually six inches at least and should not uh, be 
uh, basically less than the width of the gear there, and the length of pockets uh, should be at least 11, 11 inches. Uh, it's obvious that we have to provide basically shear studs to uh, make sure that the deck and the girders are acting together. The, de the deck panels should have uh, at least uh, 7 inches of uh, thickness. The length of deck panels is recommended to cover the full width of the bridge. If you follow this detailing, then you do not need to have longitudinal joint, so the overall durability of the bridge will be better. This option is feasible for like local loads where you, you have two lanes and maybe two X shoulders, but for wider bridge due to the grain, uh, the, the crane uh, capacity and, and, and availability, you may not be able to do that. So our best recommendation is you use one grade slabs if you can then follow or uh, detailing for the longitudinal joint and add one at the middle of the bridge and the width of uh, these deck panels should not exceed 12 feet because of the lifting cracking everything 12 feet should be a good number and we are going to uh, say that you just need to use the hidden pocket the open pocket showed uh, water leak. That's why uh, we are uh, going to say just use the hidden pocket. Here is the detailing of the hidden pocket. You will provide the construction uh, basically cover at the time of construction and when the uh, panel is placed fill that gap with the grout so when it's done you won't be able to see basically anything you won't see the joint from the top of the bridge here i'm showing that the uh basically a photograph that i took when uh, we've been pouring the grout inside the hidden pocket you can see the head at the start uh, and uh, the the like, reflection of the grout that was basically running into the joint and we are going to say that both kinds of the shear studs uh, are like viable. You may use uh, double headed studs. One, uh, one head is here, another head is embedded in the gear there. Uh, or you can use the inverted U-shaped studs. Both will work and both are fine. The only recommendation is the, uh, the embedment length of these studs should be bigger than the hunch thickness plus six times the bar diameter. If you don't provide this, then uh, these bars may pull out from, from, from the pocket. And also, the other issue we have found is if you're going to use the leveling bolt or recommendation used to, act, to use an actual bolt, the one that we had here was a threaded rod uh, and not uh, welded to the rod. We haven't seen, uh, I, I think in one case it, it, it torqued, so uh, just go with an actual uh, bolt that has a knot basically uh, attached to it. Uh, and because there are some uh, some like shrinkage cracks and it might be in uh, uh, might not be able to actually get rid of them, what I recommendation is all of the reinforcement of the deck panels should be epoxy coated just in case if the water penetrates down there. I talked about those uh, uh, those like shrinkage cracks at the hunch region. What, what a recommendation is to provide at least two bars in the hunch region uh, to provide a better durability and an like performance. And we are, we are, we are recommending that the uh, depths of the hunch region at the, uh, at the gear there mid span should not be less than 0.75 inch. This is to make sure that the grout can pass uh, uh, this this tight tight neck, and uh, regarding the glue lamp girder bridge, uh, or uh, or what a recommendation is, and it has to be uh, based on that. You have to design the girders uh, assuming full fully non composite actions. If you follow the actual requirements and the strengths provided for different types of wood 
would uh, you should be able to safely design the bridge using this assumption. Uh, we are also uh, uh, having this language in our recommendation to make sure that uh, the type rating treatment and geometry of the wood is the one that the designer wants. So that has to be checked before uh, we allow fabrication to start building the bridge. So the depth of the glue lamp uh, deck panels should be at least six inches and the decks can have uh, one grade or two grades as you can see in these detailings. And as I discussed later, uh, the tongue and groove panel to panel joints were failed under the fatigue testing. So what a recommendation is just to use uh, basically flat and uh, panel to panel joints and fill them with epoxy to make sure that uh, the entire deck is attached and like working together and there is no further damage. Uh, you, you may use a solid glue lamp diaphragm, a steel cross brace or a glue lamp uh, cross braces uh, to make sure that uh, all of the the gear that act, act as one in the uh, in the transverse direction uh, or 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 a recommendation will be to use at least three or four uh, basically cross braces along the length of the bridge and maybe the one of the most important or a concern that the DOT has was the overlay and how we can have a good overlay over the timber bridge. Uh, we did literature review and we have found, and we also inspected uh, six bridges in Minnesota and Iowa and we have found that if you use asphalt overlay, asphalt chip seal, aggregate overlay or a epoxy with embedded grit, all of these will be viable and will work well with timber decks. And if you want to save, uh, save time and the money and if, if you want to use the same abutment as the previous bridge that if you want to replace it, what our recommendation is you, you actually should be able to use that abutment from the old bridge and save cost. And we are, we are recommending this detailing to make sure that there is no uplift and there is no uh, uh, basically movement of the, grid, the girders at the end. And any uh, crash tested railing configuration that is out there and is allowed by Ashto can be used for timber, timber actually bridges. And what a recommendation is based on the law, you have to inspect the bridge every two years. However, what a, what a recommendation is to reseal the decks and all of the joints every six years for the timber bridges. Uh, for the slab bridge, uh, you may go with 2% grade or 2% uh, 2, 2 grade based on your need. And uh, we do not have on a specific longitudinal joints, the gap can be, uh, can be filled at the time of construction of those middle panels. And uh, based on ASHTO, the product of the adjacent modules of elasticity and the moment of inertia of the stiffness should be greater than 80,000 uh, kip inch squared. The minimum width of the stiffener is recommended to be 5 inches. And uh, here I'm going to show you that you are going to use at least two bolts to connect each of the stiffeners to the deck panels. And all recommendation is making sure that the length of the stiffener is not more than 75% of depth of bridge. This is make sure that the bolt doesn't penetrate to the top of the deck for improved durability. And again, if you want to use the, uh, the existing abutment, that would be absolutely fine. However, you are going to use at least two bolts at the end of the decks to make sure that there is no uplift and the uh, the deck panel stays in 
place. Uh, the the overlay that I discussed will remain the same, and I then as the last slide I would like uh, as the last slide of uh, the the study I would like to share with you the overall performance of the three uh, bridges. What a recommendation is for uh, the glue lamp slab bridge. You can go up to 30 uh, feet long. Uh, uh, or basically you can go up to 30 feet long. This is because at this time, uh, the producer here at the state cannot make deeper uh, deck panels. So if in your state or if, 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 if you have a manufacturer that can go uh, with deep deck panels, you, you should be uh, go up to 40 feet long, uh, Timber, timber, bridge, timber slab bridges. For the glue lamp girder bridge, you can go from anything between 30 feet to like 70 feet. That was our target. And for the uh, precast full depth stick panels, you can go from 40 to, to like 70 feet. Or recommendation is for the fully precast one, you may go with the longer lengths uh, because the bridge is stiff and had two or three times more than the ashto uh, uh, strength limit to state requirements so you may uh, go with a longer option and, I, and I, in terms of cost we have found that the glue lamp slab bridge costs 50 percent less than double t this only is is uh, this cost is only for like superstructure cost and the glue lamp girder bridge will cost around 15 to 20 percent less than double T, and the uh, full depth stick panel option will cost around 10 percent higher than double T bridges. So, as the conclusion of the project, all three bridge systems are viable alternatives to current double T bridges, based on the findings of the study design and construction guidelines were developed for the proposed uh, bridges and now local governments they have three more options above and beyond the double T to design or replace uh, bridges on direct local roads. Uh, we also uh, published uh, the results of this study through three journal papers and we also submitted the uh, report both to MPC and STDOT. I have a link for you if, you're, if you would like to go and download the report on the study. Uh, you, you can basically follow that uh, link. And here is the project website that I, I, I usually develop for each project. Uh, you are welcome to visit the project and see all of the videos and and also get a copy of the report from the project website as well. And now I would like to turn it to Chris if there is any uh, question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, if there are any questions from any of the participants, go ahead again. Type those questions in through the Q&A window, which is located in the bottom right-hand corner of your webinar window. And I know, Mustafa, you had mentioned that, um, you know, as people are kind of going through, you had some additional or some bonus slides that you, if time allowed, if you if you wanted to share those. Uh, you certainly could if you, if you want to kind of share some discussion on those bonus slides that you had. Uh, we do have, we do have some time to go through those if you'd like to. I... At this time, I just want to share this with you that uh, we also did two other studies. One was how to repair uh, the longitudinal joints of double T uh, uh, joints. And uh, that project is complete and our report is out there. So what our, what our recommendation was you can uh, use a continuous or pocket option and fill them with with a UHPC ultra high performance to fix the issue of existing longitudinal joints. And if you have an, an existing double T bridge that has kind of some reflective crackings or the girders are damaged, we also did another study and proposed a load rating uh, technique 
that you can relate the damage of the gear there to the load rating parameters and have a safe live load estimation of the bridge. Both of the two ACRI reports are, are available from my, my website. If you go to this link, uh, it will like, direct you to the, to the project website and you can see the outcome of the results. And there would be links to the MPC ACRI reports as well. And uh, probably it would be nice to share the these uh, like inspections. People are like always worried about the durability and long-term performance of uh, timber bridges. We went uh, to uh, Minnesota. They had a few timber bridges around 60 years old, and you can see basically four of those in this picture. After 60 years of uh, basic service life, the uh, uh, the bridge uh, rating was six and actually and like seven based on MBI, and it means that the uh, bridge was in very good shape, and uh, so so that was one 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 existing proof that uh, they can last if you maintain them and like, inspect them well. And uh, here is the uh, the glue dam option that was built in Iowa uh, in 2014. So it's like five years old now, and the bridge is performing well. So that's like another field application of the glue dam uh, here, their bridge. So Chris, I uh, uh, turn it back to you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's good to see that that little bit of information you just shared from Minnesota and Iowa. So thank you for that. I think that's valuable information for those who are listening in today. Sure. Um, Mustafa had mentioned his website, and uh, it's pretty easy to access the Mountain Plains Consortium MPC reports. Also, if you go to our website, uh, which is ugpti.org, or you can access that right there from our website, which is translearning.org, um, you can access those those. Uh, MPC reports as well. With that, um, I would like to thank you for your time and attention today for today's TLN event and visit our website again at translearning.org for upcoming learning opportunities and to access our learning management system. Thank you again for your time and attention today and have a safe day.